Is everyone ready to enter the water? I looked up from the final checks of my gear at the voice emanating from the stern of the tour boat. The midday sun, high in the sky, blinded me for a moment, and raising my hand to shield it, I focused on who it had come from. A tall, well-built man with a crew cut, sporting an almost permanent tan, shot me a pleasant smile. You already over there, Billy, he called. In response, I took a last look at my gauge readout, seeing they were all in the green, then shot the man a thumbs up. Already, Wren. He nodded, then turned to help a couple near to him, who seemed to be having some difficulty in attaching their weight belts and vests. Freaking newbies, came a voice next to me, and I turned to see my friend Lonnie shooting an annoyed stare at the two our dive leader was helping. Hey, give them a break, man, I said to him, remember, we were all once newbies ourselves. Just be happy others are still taking an interest in diving in the first place. In response, he sighed, running his fingers through his short, brown hair. Yeah, don't act like you were never in his shoes in the first place, called Vicky, my other friend. She leaned around me to shoot an exasperated look at the youngest member of our trio, narrowing her green eyes at him. Lonnie raised his hands in surrender. Okay, sheesh. I was just saying it can sometimes be a headache to deal with, even if we were once like them. Vicky shook her head at his response, then pulled back to adjust her mask on her face. Hey, no arguing here, guys, I said. We're on vacation here, remember? For a second, they both looked at me, then nodded slowly. As they finished their checks, I let out a small sigh. Why was I cursed with being the most mature of us three? I shook my head. The time for thinking that was over, and I should be enjoying myself. The three of us had decided to take a summer vacation on our college break to the beautiful areas of Papua New Guinea in Australia as a way to unwind before classes started back up in fall. It had taken a few years to pool together the money needed for the trip, but as we'd begun saving up together since freshman year, by our junior year, we had amassed enough to go. And now, we were here resting on the back of a dive boat, 10 or 15 miles off the coast, ready to dive on some of the beautiful coral reefs of the area. Today was the second to last day of our two-week trip, and at Vicky's behest, we'd planned a final diving trip before catching our flight home. My thoughts were shaken away as I heard Ren call again. Okay, folks, remember what we discussed on our voyage out here. You may separate into small groups, no smaller than three to a group, though, and make your way along the reef, but... Please, I have to stress this, under absolutely no circumstances are you to venture too far from the boat. For those who'd like a guided tour, I will be forming a group with some of our less experienced members. And with that said, be safe and have fun. I raised my mask as the final words left his lips and centered it on my face, tightening the straps to make sure no water could leak in. Picking up the regulator, I turned so my tank was facing Vicky. Could you turn me on, please? I asked. Instantly, she began to giggle, and I groaned. I didn't mean that way. Get your head out of the gutter, Vic. Still giggling, she elbowed me in the ribs. You know I hate being called that, she said in a mock warning. Yeah, I know I replied, shooting her a grin. Shaking her head, she turned the safety valve allowing air to flow into the regulator. Testing it quickly, I pulled it out. Well, you guys ready? They both nodded eagerly. I'm making sure to get a metric fuck ton of pictures this time, Lonnie exclaimed. He'd promised to grab some good photographs for Nicole, his shutterbug girlfriend who was waiting back home for him. I smiled as I turned both of their safety valves, the last thing needed before leaving the boat. Then let's get down there while the going's good. Smiling, they both put their own regulators into their mouths, and after a moment, flipped backwards into the ocean with a splash. All around me, the others in our group were doing the same. I saw Ren flip overboard, the flash of his neon yellow flippers catching the rays of the sun. And then, I was left as the only one still aboard the boat, aside from the pilot, who had ducked below for something. I quickly shot a last look around. The water had become perfectly calm again, except for the small white caps. If I didn't know any better, I'd say the others had never even been here, I thought. The air almost seemed to take on a slightly eerie feeling to it. And then it was gone, washed away like a piece of seaweed on the shore. Get your ass in the water, man. The others are waiting for you. And with that last thought, I placed a hand over my mask to protect it and rolled backwards into the deep blue. A flurry of bubbles passed in front of my vision for a second and I took a moment to let my sense of balance catch up with me. Soon, though, everything became clear, the weightless feeling providing me a sense of calm. I had scuba dived 
ever since I'd been 17, and after 8 years of experience, I now felt almost more comfortable beneath the waves than on land. Glancing around, I saw the others had already formed their own groups. The teams of two or three, or in the case of Ren's group, four or five were already swimming away from under the shadow. The boat cast onto the bright white sandy seafloor, towards the reefs almost surrounding us. I quickly spotted Vicky and Lonnie waiting for me near the bottom, and after a few kicks downward, I joined them, flashing them an okay sign. They flashed one of their own, and as a group, we swam towards the reef. As we approached, we saw a beautiful world rise up in front of us. Coral of countless colors spread out beneath us, stretching away into the distance like we were jetliners flying over a city. Brightly colored fish swam about and in the coral, going about their daily business, each with varying degrees of hurry. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the long, slim green body of a moray eel slide in between the formations in search of its next meal. For about 15 or 20 minutes, we stayed in the area, each taking plenty of photographs and video, the only sound heard being the the exhalation of our bubbles rising back towards the surface. Then Lonnie pointed a little further away from us, towards where the reef dropped deeper into the water. The section of reef we were visiting rests on a shelf, dropping a few thousand feet down over the edge. I nodded, making a mental note to keep an eye, to make sure we didn't wander too far away. As we moved into the deeper water, the animals changed. Fish became bigger, with a particularly curious trigger fish coming a little too close to comfort, causing me to shoo it away. Those things have a nasty bite I'd rather not experience personally. I kept my eyes out for the darkened form of any sharks or barracudas. Both loved swimming over the reefs in search of sick or injured fish to pick off, and though attacks weren't exactly common, it's still wise to keep your eyes peeled. Vicky lowered down close to the coral to snap a picture of a small group of red and black sea urchins, and I drank in the view for a moment, simply allowing myself to bask in the present. This has been such an amazing and wonderful trip. I'm seriously going to miss it when we go back home to the drabness of Washington. I let out a bit of a sigh, causing a rather large stream of bubbles to rise to the surface. Now wasn't the time for dwelling on what was to come, now was for enjoying what I could, while I could. I joined Vicky and snapped off the photos of the sea urchins, then looked around for Lonnie. For a moment, I didn't see him, and a small wave of trepidation coursed through me until I finally spotted him about 30 feet away. He looked to be very interested in something, and focused as well. Might as well go see what he's looking at, I thought, and tapped Vicky on the shoulder before pointing. She nodded, and together we swam over to our friend. As we drew closer, however, the focus of Lonnie's attention grew a bit clearer. I froze, hovering in the water. Oh boy. After a moment, I gently waved at Lonnie to get his attention, but it seemed he was too focused on the view through his camera lens to see it. I made a grunting sound around my regulator, but again, it seemed he didn't notice or care. I heard the sound of his camera's shutter snapping a few times, then he lowered it. For a moment, I thought he would swim away, but to my shock, and similarly to my horror, he slowly began swimming down towards it. Lonnie, no, don't be a fucking idiot. I wanted to scream it out loud, but couldn't due to the water and the regulator in my mouth. I wanted to rush towards him, but I knew it might cause even more of a dangerous situation than it already was to begin with. So, I motioned for Vicky to stay put, then swam slowly but deliberately towards the dumbass that was my friend. As he began to reach out with one hand, I reached him, grabbing him firmly by the wrist. Instantly, he shot a look up at me. Oh, now I have your attention. I shot him a look through my mask, then shook my head pointedly. He shrugged his shoulders, then looked back down. I tightened my grip, making him look back at me. Shaking my head again, I pointed for the surface. After a moment, he shook himself out of my grasp, then swam for the surface, Vicky following after him. Allowing myself to calm down a little, I gazed down at what I stopped Lonnie from being a supreme idiot in attempting to touch. The pulsate almost neon blue looking rings shined clearly up at me from the creature's perch in a patch of coral. Small, black, beady eyes gazed warily up at me and the yellowish body stood out in the green background. A blue ringed squid, one of the most venomous species of animal in the world. Although it was small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, it had enough venom in it to kill multiple full grown men with one bite of its beak. And that dingbat just tried touching it. Yeah, real brilliant, dude. Shaking my head and feeling my annoyance give way to a small flash of anger, I kicked for the surface myself, making sure not to disturb the small animal. What the hell is your problem, man? With the first words I heard, as my head broke the 
surface. I spat the regulator out of my mouth. My problem. Dude, are you a fucking dumbass or do you have a death wish to try and touch a blue ringed squid? I saw Vicky's face go slightly pale. She hadn't realized what he'd been about to poke. Lon, are you fucking nuts? She exclaimed. Lonnie's face grew dark and I could tell he was getting irritated, but I frankly didn't care. The man was more of a daredevil than I was, which was saying something, considering I once jumped off the roof of a three-story apartment into a pool for fun. But this time, like many before, his fearlessness had crossed the line from bravery into stupidity. I was only going to brush it. It's not like I was going to annoy it or anything, he grumbled. I stifled a harsh laugh. Dude, it was flashing the rings of blue, which means you already annoyed it. If you'd touched it, it would have absolutely bit you. I narrowed my eyes at him, and I don't know if you remember this particular little detail, but there is no antidote or antivenom for it. Lonnie let out a disgusted sigh. You're a good friend, Billy, but sometimes you drag me down with your safety, especially following the rules. For a moment, I felt my temper flare up, almost to the point I wanted to punch the guy straight in the schnoz. But thankfully, Vicky came to my rescue, seeing me angry. Hey, come on, let's not fight, okay? We've got... She checked her dive watch. 40 minutes left before the dive leader calls us back to the boat. So let's not waste this. She turned to Lonnie. You need to realize Billy might have just saved your ass, so you don't have to thank him, but let's at least move away somewhere else, okay? Lonnie didn't answer her, but nodded his head. She let out a sigh of relief. Now, I saw an open patch of sandy bottom in a section of even deeper water close to the drop-off. I thought I saw a few rays swimming over it, so let's go check that out for our final exploration. Okay, I nodded. Okay, Lonnie again said nothing, but nodded as well. Each of us put our regulators back into our mouths, then slipped back below the waves. It took us about 25 to 27 minutes to swim to the section Vicky had mentioned. I hadn't realized it was so far from the boat, and Ren's words of caution flashed through my mind. I glanced back and could still just see the underside of the boat bobbing up and down in the clear water. Well, we're still near to know when it's time to leave. The thought brought me some comfort, and I turned back to survey the area we'd arrived at. It was almost strange, the clear, sandy area formed an almost perfect circle of about 60 or 70 feet across. Looking out, I saw a few more a little further along the reef, but they only seemed to start around here where the depth, according to my gauge, was about 65 feet. For a moment, I stayed where I was. An odd feeling had just come over me, one I'd never had before. I couldn't exactly place what it was, but I was certainly not fond of the tightening sensation in my gut. I glanced around, looking to see if it was an instinctive reaction from a predator in the area, but I saw nothing, must just be because of the fight, I guess. Trying to shake it away, I swam down to join my friends at the bottom. As I approached, Lonnie quickly swam away from me. A small flicker of annoyance came back into me, then faded just as quickly. Just let him be, he'll get over it sooner or later. I turned to Vicky, who gestured around with a look of wonder, etched on her face through the mask. My curiosity over the circle returned the forefront of my mind, and together we began to explore the sandy circle. I was halfway through with a second swim over when something caught my attention. I swam closer to the seafloor, trying to distinguish it from the trillions of grains of sand. There, is that, is that a shark tooth? It certainly looked like it, standing out enough with its whiter hue than the surrounding area. I reached down and gently ran my index finger over it. The hard feeling, combined with the serrated edge confirmed it. A thought flashed through my mind. I've always wanted a shark tooth necklace. Maybe I could make one out of this. It would be the perfect memento to remember the trip. Careful not to cut myself on the edges, I attempted to lift it up but it seemed to be stuck in the sand. I pulled a little harder, but still no luck. Mentally sighing, I reached into a small pack around my waist and pulled a pair of diving gloves from them. I need them to hold on tighter without cutting myself. Slipping them on, I again sank down to the floor and gripped the tooth. After a few seconds fighting, it seemed to start to give, but it didn't come up. I don't care how long it takes, I'm not leaving without you. I pulled harder and finally felt it begin to lift. But, something felt odd. It felt like something was connected to the tooth still. I yanked one final time, a small cloud of sand flying up and blurring my vision. After a moment, it cleared and I looked down at the relatively heavy object in my hand. 
and let out a muffled shout of surprise around my regulator, dropping it quickly, it floated lazily back down to the sand, where it kicked up a much smaller cloud to mark its return. I remained where I was, staring at it and attempting to comprehend exactly what I was looking at. Many teeth stared back at me, along with a black, lifeless eye, which looked like a doll's eye. I was staring at the head of a rather large tiger shark. Just ahead, not far ahead of where the pectoral fins should be, was an almost surgically neat slice which marked where the decapitation had occurred. I kept staring at it, my heartbeat slowing, but the uneasy feeling from the nasty surprise remaining. Well, never thought I'd find that, I thought. A second later, I began to wonder what had happened to it. It couldn't have been a boat or fisherman, the wound was far too neat and clean. But what in the hell lives on a reef, which preys on a damn tiger shark? The thought made the uneasy feeling rise slightly. That was when I noticed something else. When we'd first arrived at the area, I thought the sandy bottom was perfectly flat. But it wasn't. It was almost in a depression, the outer edges of the circle the highest, with the center dipped down as if there were an open space which had been filled with the sand. For some reason, a shiver flashed up my spine at the thought. Something rumbled in the back of my mind. A piece of knowledge I had learned many years ago, but I couldn't place it. Not being able to recollect it quickly was causing the uneasy feeling to grow, and well inside me, I flashed another look around, seeing Vicky attempting to catch up with Lonnie who had already begun moving towards the next circular sandy area. That was when something I'd only slightly noticed before fully clicked into place in my mind. When the feeling had first come over me, I looked around to see if any sharks, barracudas, or other large fish were nearby. I hadn't seen any, but that was not the only thing I hadn't seen. The fish. Where did all the fish go? Even in the deeper sections of the reef, there should have been life everywhere, but I saw not a sign of life. I could see the flashes of them farther away, about two two or three hundred feet back, but past a certain point, there were no fish out here, almost as if they know to avoid this area. Another shiver rolled up my spine at the thought, and I decided then and there that it was time for us to head back to the boat. I kicked hard towards the other two, and in a few seconds, reached them. I tapped both on the shoulders, and they turned to regard me, Lonnie still harboring a look of irritation and anger in his eyes. I gestured back towards the direction of the boat, then pointed to my dive watch. After a moment, Vicky understood and nodded. However, Lonnie shook his head at me, and instead pointed to the largest circular clear area of sand I'd seen yet. I took one look and shook my head fiercely. It was far too close to the drop off in what had to be 80 or 90 feet of water. No, no way in hell, even if I wasn't having this feeling. Even more hell no, because I am. I pointed again at my watch, then stabbed back towards the boat. I saw Lonnie's eyes flash with anger, and in response, he flipped me the bird before kicking hard away from us, towards the circle. I let out a muffled growl of anger, then felt a gentle hand on my shoulder. Turning, I saw Vicky motioning for me to calm myself. I closed my eyes for a moment, then opened them and nodded at her. I was not normally this easily agitated, but the prior argument, coupled with the uneasy feeling which now felt more ominous, was setting me easily on edge. I pointed towards Lonnie, then back towards to boat to more or less say let's go get him and head back she nodded then together we swam after our friend he had already reached the circle and was beginning across it as we descended the water began to feel a little chillier as the sun's warmth couldn't reach this far down closing to within about 20 feet of the edge the ominous feeling i'd been harboring in my gut suddenly crucendoed and every instinctive feeling in me told me to turn around i didn't hesitate spinning around to confront nothing there was nothing there i looked around my head rotating on a swivel to try and locate whatever had set me off but nothing presented itself out of the darker blue gloom i felt a hand touch my side and turned to see vicky staring at me she shrugged her shoulders raising her hands as if to ask what's the matter unable to answer her i simply shook my head then pointed out back towards the way we'd come a sudden unexpected surge of water behind us caused us both to be pushed forward the rapid change making me feel a bit disoriented. What the hell was that? I wondered and looked at Vicky. She, too, was looking around and turned to me, shrugging again. Shaking my head and feeling even more uneasy, I turned back around. 
For a moment, I couldn't comprehend what my eyes were telling me and I felt a sense of disbelief wash over me. What the fuck? Lonnie was gone. There was no sign he'd ever even been there. And save for a rather large settling cloud of sand drifting down towards the seafloor, there was no sign of disturbance either. I looked around, feeling the confusion give way to a mixture of shock and concern. Where the actual fuck did he go? He had been close to the center of the circle, too far in to have swam out of, without us seeing where he'd gone. My gaze drifted to the edge of the drop off, looking down into where the water changed from blue to almost black as it fell away into nothingness. I shook my head. He's not that suicidally dumb, but the process of elimination hadn't helped me one bit. If anything, it was causing a new feeling to well up inside of me, a mixture of two emotions, fear and dread. Vicky locked eyes with me, and I could see the same look of concern and fear emblazed in her eyes. She gestured wildly to the empty area in front of us, then waved around as if to show the obvious. After a moment, I shook my head. Even I'd been able to speak, I had no answer to give her. She hesitated for a moment, then kicked hard for the circle. After a moment's hesitation myself, I began to kick after her. By the time I reached the edge of the circle, she was about a third of the way across. I stopped at the edge, hovering just above the coral formations and let my gaze sweep across the sandy bottom. Just like the other circles we'd passed, this one, too, looked to be formed into a bit of a depression. Or in this case, two or three depressions for a circle with a circumference of about two of three hundred feet across. I kept scanning the bottom from side to side. Just like the other circles as well, there was no sign of life in it. Well, not entirely none. Unlike the other circles, I saw this one actually had something in it. At odd intervals across the circle, I saw what looked to be a strange object poking almost straight out upwards. They rose about half a foot off the bottom, swaying gently in the current rolling in from the open ocean, similar to how seagrass would. But there was no seagrass in this area. I saw Vicky reach the other edge of the circle and, not finding anything, turn and begin swimming quickly back to me. My eyes were drawn back to the swaying protrusions and for some reason, I couldn't tell you why, every single alarm bell began to go off in my head looking at them. The feeling of fear and dread, which had dipped slightly as I'd studied the circle, suddenly rolled over me like a tsunami. Vicky had reached almost the center of the circle now and I saw her raise her hands in a shrug at me again, pointing back towards the boat to say we should head there. I quickly waved for her to join me, wanting her to get out of the circle as fast as she could. A thought had begun to swim its way forward in my brain, along with a memory from years ago, one which I shook away. That was impossible. In response, she held up a finger and stopped for a moment, likely to rest after swimming so hard. What happened next happened in the blink of an eye. One second, all was chill as she hovered about a foot off the bottom. The next, the sandy seafloor almost seemed to explode upwards, as if someone had buried a live grenade in the bottom and pulled the pin. A huge surge of water, this one far more powerful than the first had been slammed into me and I was pushed back, going ass over tea kettle in a sort of underwater pirouette. I quickly uprighted myself and turned back towards the circle, and I let out a muffled scream, seawater flowing in around my regulator as I felt all the blood drain from my face. I only caught a split second glimpse of it, but that microsecond was far too long. I saw the long, cylindrical body rising up out of the sand, broken up into many segments with a ribbon of blue and green running down the middle, as if someone had painted a line down its stomach. I saw numerous legs wiggling in the water as it rose almost four or five feet off the bottom. I saw the protrusions rising above all of it. No, not protrusions, feelers. And I saw the four huge, razor shark mandibles which had snapped shut around. Oh, God, no. Vicky had been snared in their grasp. I could see they had snapped shut around her midsection and blood had begun pouring out into the water. My eyes locked with hers, which had gone wide behind her mask. For a moment, she seemed to reach out towards me, and then it, and she was gone, yanked back below the sand faster than I could comprehend. I breathed rapidly, knowing it wasn't good for my air supply, but not caring. My mind was racing to catch up with what I'd just seen, and I began to shake uncontrollably. I, I didn't just see that, that's fucking impossible, what the fuck? But no, I could see it clearly now. I could see the feelers, at least three pairs of them, poking out from the sandy bottom. I could see the faint outline of the mandibles, poised open towards the surface just beneath the sand. 
The edges curved wickedly, and I felt another shudder pass through me as I stared at them. They were waiting, waiting for something or someone careless enough to swim over them. Then I felt the biggest surge of dread and horror course through me as the sand began to move, parted as the unseen creatures began to rise from their ambush spot. They knew the gig was up, their hiding spot had been blown. I watched in horror as the huge, half-worm, half-centipede-like creatures emerged from their hidey holes. Each had to be at least 30 to 40 feet long. I've never been someone who's been afraid of insects or creepy crawlers, as my grandfather used to say, but these things made me cower as if I were a child being confronted by the boogeyman hiding in the closet. They each swam away, towards another circle about 30 feet away. In moments, they had reburied themselves and the water cleared. It was as if nothing had happened. That was when the fear in me climaxed. Not all of them had moved on. One was still there. It had fully pulled itself from its hole and lay draped across the sand. The head, one I could see had no eyes, raised off the bottom and it slowly began to move forward. Towards me, I realized how much of an easy target I had made myself. In an instant, I turned and kicked as hard as I could away back towards the boat. I felt a surge of water pass by, not far behind me, and I heard the sickening sound of something snapping closed on empty water. I knew what it had been and the mental image spurred me to swim faster. I felt my leg muscles begin to burn, but I refused to stop. I screamed around my regulator again, the mental image of my friend vanishing into the seafloor being replaced with one of myself, my hand extending towards the surface as I was dragged under it to be consumed. I didn't dare look back, didn't want to see if it was still giving chase. I just kept swimming. The minutes ticked by in my head, but even when I reached the shallow area of the reef, the fish reappearing in abundance, I refused to slow. Rounding a coral formation, I crashed headlong into something. My mind, fried from the adrenaline and fear swimming in my veins in equal, copious amounts didn't register what it was at first. I felt something grab me and I began to lash out, kicking and punching in every direction. It got ahead of me, it got ahead of me and now I'm dead. I heard the sound of a grunt, a human grunt. Focusing, I realized I'd swim headlong into one of the other divers. To be specific, I'd swam into Ren. I calmed down for a moment, then pushed out of his grasp and kicked for the surface. I broke into the afternoon air, yanking the regulator from my mouth and wrenching the mask off my face. I treaded water and began to sob. When Ren surfaced beside me, the only thing I could tell him was that my friends were gone. I could barely say anything more beyond the area near the drop-off, as I couldn't stop crying and shaking. The image of Vicky being snatched and dragged below the sand kept replaying over and over in my head, and it took center stage of my focus. I was barely aware of being pulled towards and aboard the dive boat, or of Ren radioing in the emergency. However, when I heard him mention going back into the water to search for them, I shot upwards, barely managing to make out a single sentence. Stay, stay out of the circles, don't go in the circles. That was a week and a half ago. I'm still in Papua New Guinea as there is an inquiry going on right now. I was taken to the hospital where it was decided I had gone into a shock from the traumatic experience I'd been through. I did manage to make out my story to the doctors and police, though. I knew I'd sound insane, but there was no way I could not tell them the truth. They needed to know. They didn't believe me. Of course, the story they decided on after hearing my story and disregarding it was that Lonnie and Vicky had made a sort of suicide pact, swimming down over the edge of the drop-off to drown. They made it because as it turned out, and to my shock, both Lonnie and Vicky had been on antidepressants. They found the bottles in their bags when their belongings had been brought to the police station. Neither one of them had told me they struggled with their mental health. It's easy to understand why my insane story about giant, insect-like creatures would be disregarded as the ravings of someone who saw two people close to him kill themselves. It's an interesting fit, but I know the truth. Both Lonnie and Vicky's parents are flying out here right now. The police told me, along with mine, are on the next flight from the states here. I honestly don't know what I'll say to them, any of them, when they get here. Every night I've gone back to my hotel room, I've raided the minibar, drinking to try and expel the memory from my conscious brain, but not even the alcohol is enough to chase away the nightmares. Nightmares of being back underwater and seeing in crystal clear detail the nightmarish creature pulling my friend
friend down to her death and the red blood which began to seep up through the sand before they appeared. I wake up screaming at the image of that one which came after me. I've been doing a lot of research on my laptop since I'm more or less confined to my hotel room until my parents get here. The thought I had before that hell erupted from the seafloor never left my mind and I remembered what I'd seen years ago in the Seattle Aquarium. And, as much as I didn't want to find out if I was right, I typed two words into the search bar with slightly shaking fingers. Babbit Worm. When the image results came up, I began to shake uncontrollably before slamming the screen shut. I will never go back into the ocean again, not after seeing what I have, not after knowing what lies, not only beneath the waves, but below the seafloor itself. I highly doubt I'd be able to convince anyone else to believe me, but I'm writing this and posting this here as a warning. If you ever go scuba diving, especially down in this part of the world, and you ever come across a large, circular sandy area surrounded by coral reef with seemingly nothing in it, Please, for the love of God, take my advice, stay away from it. Thank you to my superfans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacey, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.